Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this morning's meeting. As we prepare to return to our study in Saul, the church, and us, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction? Shall we seek his face so that we may more clearly understand not only what he is presenting before us, but also the duty that we have unto him that has been so gracious at this time in our lives? Shall we now ask for his blessing? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath, for these hours of rest. We thank you, Father, for the ability we have to assemble together, to meet together, to listen and to learn. Help us now, Father. Guide us. May your will be done. May we study together. May we look in unity upon that which you would have us to understand. Direct us now. Be with us, we ask. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us so that we may become unified to doing the work that you would have us to do. Direct us to this end. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we are beginning this study, in the chat, I ask if people could please read Jonah 3, verse 10. Is there anyone that has this open and that could read this at this time? Yeah. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now, for the nine verses preceding this, Sister White, under her name, the following was presented in, Pro in Prophets and Kings, page 270. The message was not in vain. The cry that rang through the streets of the godless city was passed from lip to lip until all the inhabitants had heard the startling announcement. The Spirit of God pressed the message home to every heart and caused multitudes to tremble because of their sins and to repent in deep humiliation. What message was this? What message was being presented in the third book of Jonah? Like in, in, in what way do you mean what message? I mean, it's a message of repentance, like the first angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message. Is that what you mean by what message? No, I'm being quite literal. Was there not a message given to Nineveh that there was a destruction that was soon to fall upon Nineveh if they did not repent? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a message of repentance because of the coming destruction. Now, is this unlike the message that was to be given to Nashville? It's not unlike it at all. It's just like it. Now, keep this in mind as we go through the balance of this document. Uh, um, Dwight, I have a question. Yes, brother. Well, I was told, I was told that, um, that, um, just because Nashville did not, um, uh, repent, they did not repent that, that that message was not the message that, um, how would you say it? That would, um, parallel it, as similar as it wasn't as similar as Jonah's message because the city of Nineveh repented. But Nashville didn't. That's what I'm being told. Okay. Well, some in Nashville repented. Oh yeah, I I know I understand that, and I agree. It, it, somebody, I mean, they did. Some of them repented. I'm sure. Yeah, I know people contacted me who said that that you know one is some of them moved out of Nashville because of it, but they took the warning seriously. Yeah, and, and I. And some of them said, we're saying we need to apologize to those people that moved out of Nashville because we gave the warning and it put them in um, financial straits and stuff like that. Yeah, except that, um, <laughs> I mean, that's crazy um, because Nashville is going to be destroyed. Yeah, my question is this, though. Do we have to apologize for people moving out of Nashville? No. Of so let me, let me ask you. Isn't 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 there a call, uh, you know, that we should repent of July, of the Nashville prediction? Jeff has made that call. Yeah. A call. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I understood. Yeah. Okay. But to to respond to Brother Williams' question, the last several weeks we've been going over this document about Saul, the church, and us. Right, William? That's right. How are we looking at this study. Are we applying this study to the church? Are we applying it to the world? Or are we applying it to ourselves? 
I was thinking we were applying it to ourselves. That's agreed. Now, in that this... That would be in harmony with last night's... That would be in harmony with last night's study as well, yeah? Exactly. Now, in this situation, the movement gave a warning to Nashville. Is that is that correct statement? Yes, it is. Now, did Sister White say that such a warning was to be given? She did. Now, when we look at the situation, and I am applying the situation with Saul in this case, when this warning was given, was the heart of the movement right with God? I would say no, we weren't. Agreed. Um, I'd, I'd say yes, we were. Okay. We were united on it. There were some that were united. There were many that were not united. And the reason, Kelly, that I can say that, I was a witness to the meetings that took place both before and after July 18th. And I know exactly the type of attitude that was being expressed by those that were at the head of the movement against those that came to believe and look to understand the reasons behind the warning to Nashville being given at that time. Now, in this way, was the head of the movement leading us properly? Well, definitely not. Now, now Jeff has even said that prior to July 18th that he had stopped listening to anything that I was saying. Correct. And... Now, I'm not sure, you know, because sometimes he would ask me a question in an email. So, but definitely he wasn't following any of the studies that I was doing. And, and this was because of prejudice of things that had happened when Heidi and I were there in 2018 and early 2019. And, and even things like having uh, Chuck Holmes, you know, do a presentation in one of our studies. You know, of course, Jeff didn't watch the study. He just heard rumors about it. Um, not understanding my purposes. So he didn't, he didn't take the time to actually understand what was going on. And this was a big problem because there was a lot of opposition to me as a person for personal reasons, nothing to do with what was being presented, just people's feelings about me as a person. And um, I know that people from Canada who went down there for the camp meeting in, I guess it was in October of, of uh, 2019 came back with a, a very cold attitude towards me um, that they never, you know, they never talked to me about what it was, but definitely I was treated differently. And that was because of rumors and gossip. So the problem that we had in this movement really was a, a, unaware of our own. We were unaware of our own problems. That was our biggest problem. Right. And, and and focused upon, you know, somebody else as the problem. So there wasn't the humility that was really needed to be truly united in what we were doing. Now, if I may comment on that as well, Theodore, your experience. I was there in 2017, 15 and 17, I think. Anyway, went a few times. But I remember being surrounded after you're, like, physically surrounded by brothers down there, um, uh, demanding that I explain the and accept their idea that Theodore was in apostasy because of the, your paper, uh, why there isn't a 2,520-year prophecy for Israel or something like this. Yeah, for literal Israel. But, yeah, they were they were very, very upset at the, just the title. They hadn't read it or anything. And I just calmly kept looking at them. Well, have you read it? But, yeah, there was quite a spirit of uh, misunderstanding more than anything, I think. Well, my, my view is that these types of things happen because of jealousy, party spirit. Um, basically, just people are unconverted. When you treat others in that way, when you don't take the time to patiently look at what somebody's saying, I mean, they could be wrong, but it, you can be very wrong in how you're not actually, one is you're not helping that person. None of those people ever talk to me about it, right? So people would talk to others about supposedly things I said or believed, but they wouldn't talk to me about it. And and one of the things that I've always had happen is people say, well, I don't talk to Theodore because if I do, he's so convincing, you know, I will be convinced. So I have to not talk to him because he's, I don't know what it is they think that I do. But, um, but 
we need to recognize that we have to spend time studying with people, even when they differ in ideas that we have. And, and that is not something that our movement was willing to do and still has not been since then, for the most part. Now, I believe it was in 2019 that you and I were at one of the meetings down there, Kelly. Isn't that right? Yeah, I'm trying to remember like that one that we did meet. And I guess it would be. Yeah, it was 2019. Yeah. Oh, like I went three times. Yeah, you went in 2014, 2015, and 2019, Kelly. That That's the years. Yeah. Yeah. 2017, I started running the business. So I didn't go that year, I think. Now, at that time, Hugh and I had a lot of conversations. We found that we had a lot of common ground. And our conversations were always very genial. Now, some of the yeah. other, some of the other conversations that I had with others that I had known much longer than I've known you were not so genial. They were always pressing for a, for me to make a decision in line with what they believed was correct. So that's my testimony mm. about what I was seeing at, at these meetings. I mean, I, I only went to Arkansas twice. But I, I found that there was not so much a spirit of unity, but a spirit of we want you to conform with us in order to be in unity. And that's not the kind of unity that any of the apostles, disciples, or others had with their upper room experience. Now, yeah, you don't tell people to fall in line. Yeah. No, you don't. Yeah. Yeah, in 2016, Heidi and I were there, of course, as you know, for the School of the Prophets, and then they invited us back um, for the camp meeting in October in 2016. You know, Heidi had been anointed and been healed of her fibromyalgia. The voices had stopped in her head, different things like that. And there was a guy who was a filmmaker who was there and was really interested in the movement. He wanted to just get Heidi's testimony on on video. And so, you know, we were there just outside um, over by one of the houses. And, you know, he, he asked her some questions and she gave her testimony. And Bronwyn walked up and and shut it down and said that he had no permission to film on the at the school and that um, he had to yield up the video and uh, that he and that, you know, definitely he could not publish it anywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, he was turned quite off from the message at that point. And there was lots of people. That was the biggest camp meeting they ever had um, at the School of the Prophets. And most of the people, I believe, who left, uh, left with a bad taste in their mouth. There was lots of people who were kicked out. Um, people who were sincerely looking for truth. Um, but because, you know, they believed some things that weren't in line with the message, they were asked to leave. But these are people their first time really uh, looking into the message. And uh, so I was not very impressed with that. But, you know, you could go on and on about these types of problems. The thing is, within our movement, within ourselves, these problems exist. So it's easy to see it in someone else, much more difficult to see it in yourself. Thank you. Now, the comment that was made in the chat, to repent for the Nashville warning would be to repudiate Ellen White and to repudiate the Lord. Was mm -hmm. Jonah rebuked by God for giving a false prediction when Nineveh repented? No. And then the reference is given of Ezekiel 3, 17 to 19. Jonah did what God told him to do, even though he Jonah was not accepting of what God had said. Now, in our studies the last few weeks, like last week, I said we would return to these two paragraphs. In detaining Samuel, it was the purpose of God that the heart of Saul should be revealed, that others might know what he would do in an emergency. Did Christ ever reveal the heart of Judas before the other disciples. No. Uh -uh. Why? They probably didn't want to cause disunion among them. 
this and there unity. Were, there, there were many of the disciples that thought that Judas was a a great leader within their group, did they not? Yeah. So God had to show not only Saul, but had to show the people what Saul would do in an emergency. It was a trying position in which to be placed, but Saul did not obey orders. He felt that it would make no difference who approached God or in what way. And full of energy and full of self com- self-complacency, he put himself forward into the sacred office. Had Nashville occurred on July 18th, many that are not seeking unity but conformity would have become very self-complacent. They would have believed we are prophets. We are doing God's work for God. Have any of you heard that within the church? Kind of similar statements here and there. Exactly. Now, right now, I'm beginning to see that a type of revival is beginning in many areas of the church where they believe that we have done the work that God has sent us to do. We have cast out those that don't believe as we do. We have cast out those that want to hold on to the ways that are not according to the interpretation of Hebrew. We're casting out these 2520 people. We're casting out those that don't honor the conference and the leadership the way that they should. Are we to honor man or are we to honor God? Who are we following? Good. Thank you. The Lord has his appointed agencies. And if these are not discerned and respected by those who are connected with his work, if men feel free to disregard God's requirements, they must not be kept in positions of trust. They would not listen to counsel, nor to the commands of God through his appointed agencies. Like Saul, they would rush into a work that was never appointed them. And the mistakes they would make in following their human judgment would place the Israel of God where their leader could not reveal himself to them. Sacred things would become mingled with the common. When have we seen sacred things become mingled with common things? Did this not occur? Go ahead. Sorry, Dwight. I think in your descriptions of what was going on in FFA, where that guy that wanted to film was was expelled and was re- rebuked when he should have been allowed to film, and that that would have been a testimony to the entire world. Yes. I mean, when you're combining uh, man's oppressiveness and pretending you're doing the work of God, that's disgusting. Well, my other thought was this. Sacred things becoming mingled with the common. Did we not see this in the description of what occurred with Nadab and Abihu? Yes. How did Nadab and Abihu mingle common with sacred? Well, they went into the sanctuary of strange fire and they were drunk. Agreed. The symbol of being drunk means that they have accepted doctrine of Babylon, right? Amen. The strange fire is light that is not of God. Now, in this situation, July 18th was a message that went to the whole world. July 18th was a message to wake up the movement and the church. What was the response of the church? Does anyone remember? It was it was distancing denial and, uh, and uh, uh, publishing statements, uh, yeah, denying it. And what happened to the movement after July 18th? Splinter. I was, call the movement. Okay. I was there when Jeff said he should be treated as the leper outside the camp. I was there as others attempted to take control and look for conformity. Not many stood in opposition. Those that did were immediately cast out. Saul did not bear the test. He showed just what he would do under the pressure of circumstances. 
the Lord saw that if Saul pursued such a course in an emergency, the people would follow his example and thus no distinction would be made between the sacred and the common. By his example, he would leave it open for the men of war to assume the priesthood on any occasion or in any emergency. Brothers and sisters, there are those that will be being called to becoming part of a unified group that is going to give a message, that is going to give the third angel's message in clarity so that the entire world can understand it. Those that give this message will be purified, made white, and tried. Now, as a question, in the book of Acts, there was a deacon chosen. How many deacons were chosen at the time to be of service to those that needed service within the church? Seven. Uh, But the number seven doesn't mean anything, does it? One of those sevens, one of those seven deacons was Stephen. Here is Stephen giving a message. Did he give a message that was true? Yes, very true. Yes, he did. And And what? I said it cut them to the heart. People don't like the truth about themselves. Who is the one person you can never lie to? God. How about the man or the woman in the mirror? We lie to ourselves when we attempt to justify ourselves. Agreed. Our Heavenly Father knows everything. We cannot even attempt to lie to him. He knows our heart better than we do. Here, God was trying to show Saul his heart, and he was trying to show Saul's heart to all of those around him. But Saul didn't like this. Therefore, he declared to Saul through Samuel, thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. How did this rebuke affect Saul? The next paragraph shows us. After this severe rebuke, Samuel left Saul to pursue his own way and follow his own impulses. And Saul found that the work left for him to do, he had left undone. He had not acted his part as a kingly general over armies. Brothers and sisters, after July 18th, the call should have been made that we need to study. We need to come together. We need to put aside our differences and determine why this, like October 22nd, 1844, did not occur as we thought it would. Did this occur? No, it did did not. Okay. Who was the general at that time before July 18th? Jeff Bedinger. Yes. When When the movement needed leadership the most, it was said, you should treat me as a leper outside the camp. The Hebrews had depended upon the facilities of the Philistines for their instruments of war. Many have depended upon others to tell them what the Bible says, and leaving it up to other men to tell them how the Bible should be interpreted. The Philistines had been wiser than the Hebrews, and had worked diligently to prevent them from learning to make their own swords and spears. When the crisis came, there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, and so it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan, Jonathan, his son, was there found. Only Saul and Jonathan had a spear and a sword. Are we not to take up the spear and the sword of the Lord? Are we not to have our Bibles prepared, ready at all times to stand up to defend what the Lord has shown us. When we went through Ezekiel 9, what do these men that come to the city have with them? Throwing swords. 
do they not have a slaughtering weapon? Is that not what scripture says? Amen. Now, is this a literal slaughtering weapon? No. Okay. Throughout the movement, we depended upon our general to show us what was being said in scripture. Many of us took the time to check what was being said. Do not take my word for it. Study this for yourselves. Was a comment that went on repeatedly. Just like Israel of old, many did not choose to check it for themselves. Humbling themselves, seeking God privately to understand what was to be said and what was being done. Okay, comment from the chat. Elder Pippinger was depressed and discouraged as Elijah had been after Jezebel's threat, but he has not been renewed by the Lord in giving a pure message as Elijah was. There are distracting apostates influencing him. Paul said that if he were to be diverted by man, he could not be the servant of God. How like Miller is Elder Pippinger today? That's fulfilling every every aspect of it, just about. Okay. Thus, Saul was left without special direction from the Lord, and he knew not what to do. He had but a small army, and this was incomplete and unorganized, many of his soldiers hiding away for fear. As he looked at the immense armies of the Philistines, he felt that he must trust to his own skill and aptitude for success. In Jonathan, the son of Saul, the Lord saw a man of pure integrity, one whom he could draw nigh, and upon whom, whose heart he could move. Now, Saul was left to understand that he was not selected as priest. He was not selected to present offerings before God. He was not selected to be the one through whom God was to speak. That was to fall to Samuel. Saul had been selected to be the captain of the Lord's host, to be the general of their armies, to be a personal representation as the Israelites had requested. Did he fulfill that which God would have him to do? He didn't. Right. Now, Sister White, in letter 115 of 1890, I will ask no pay of the conference for the remainder of the year, for I am not in a fit condition to travel and labor. I fear without special direction from the Lord bidding me to go and bear my testimony that I shall be presumptuous. Was Saul presumptuous when he came to offer his sacrifices? Mm -hmm. Here is Mrs. White saying that She's not asking to be paid, for she was not in a fit condition to travel or labor. That if she didn't have special instructions, that she would be presumptuous. This is taking place in 1890, two years about after the 1888 General Conference session. Isn't it about this time that the General Conference decided that she needed to go to Australia? Mm -hmm. I know that Jesus is my restorer, but I shall be presumptuous if I do, if I have done, carrying the burdens I have carried without change or rest and going where, wherever invited because I fear I should show want of faith if I do not go. Thus, I have worked ever since I stepped from the steamer upon American soil and Satan had worked up matters so that my burdens and my labors could be 50-fold greater than there was any need of these being. Brother Butler has been at the foundation of it all, but he makes no confession and writes in the papers as, it, as though he were all right. Now, with what we were reading last night from Elder Jones, was this not taking place from what he wrote about 1901, or was it yeah. later? Well, 1901 and and afterwards, because Ellen White called for reorganization in 1901, and they they sort of started at it, but then it fell apart. Right. So, 
1890, Brother Butler was increasing the burdens on Ellen White 50-fold. Interesting number, 50, because we know that seven times is supposed to represent seven years. Seven times seven, or 49, brings us to a jubilee. 50 brings us to a year of release. Now, if we made the same application upon what Mrs. White is writing here, that Brother Butler had increased her burdens 50-fold, do we now take this as a measure of weight, one pound by two pounds by four pounds by eight, et cetera, et cetera, until we get 50-fold, as many have attempted to do when we're dealing with the seven times? Brother Butler made her labor more odorous, even though he was regarded by her as being one of the old pioneers. He came to understand his need of repentance. She continued, Now, unless the Lord bids me, I shall not address the church here in Battle Creek until Elder Smith and those who have been in harmony with him show their colors. I set no stakes in this, but I will know that the Lord bids me before I get the burden on my soul for the ones for whom I have labored so hard without the least acknowledgement or response or retraction on their part. I have had to vindicate myself and my brethren, press with all my powers against the prejudice, the unbelief, the false statements, and the misrepresentations until it almost gives me a nervous chill to think of the blindness and unreasonable Phariseeism that has been adjusted as a garment about men in prominent positions. If they have changed their course of criticism and scattering the seeds of doubt and unsettling the confidence of the churches in the testimonies, I ask, who is the wiser for it? What confession and restitution and restoring of confidence have they done? Will the past be blotted out of the books of heaven where they are registered without one humiliation on their part for wounding and bruising the souls of God's people by their jealousies, their evil surmising, and the opposition to that which is pure Bible truth, or just because they were unwilling it should come from the source which the Lord chose to send it. When the Lord sent a message through elders Wagner and Jones, what was the reaction of the church? Well, they rejected it. Did Elders Wagner and Jones understand that this was a message from God? It had to. Did Elders Wagner and Jones understand that this was the church that God had raised up to give the final message to the world? I hope so. I believe that they did. But I also believe that they were left very confused. Why would God's appointed vessel? His appointed people reject a message so directly and so completely from heaven. Why would it be that they chose not to accept what was being said? Here we are today. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, please. Well, well, it would be because of sin, wouldn't it? I would agree. And what did this sin lead to? It led to them... Being separated from God, did it? Did they have vision? And I'm not speaking of elders Wagner and Jones. Did the leadership of the church have the vision that God would have sent them? No, they did not. They rejected it. So if if they have rejected this, if they had no vision, then what could we say they were? They were going to perish. Okay, but when you have no vision, what are you? They're blind. Exactly. No vision is yeah, people. Okay. If they're blind, how can they lead? When Christ was upon the earth, he came to a man, and this man had been blind since birth. What did Christ do on his behalf? He opened his eyes. How did he do it? He used a spittle, uh, mud. He spit on the clay. 
and he put this on the man's eyes, correct? Yep. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and what happened? He saw and he said he saw men as trees. Okay. Now, the leaders of the church at that time became angry. Why? Maybe because they didn't come to them first. On the Sabbath, too. Yeah. He, he did this healing on the Sabbath. Right. Now, the health message is the right arm of the gospel. Christ had been proclaiming that the time of the Jews was at hand, that he had come to save the nation Israel. John the Baptist, his cousin, had given a warning message that it was time for them to repent. Did they accept the message of John the Baptist? No. If they're not going to accept the message of John the Baptist, how can they accept the message of Christ? The Lord came. The Lord comes to a man that had been blind since birth. The Lord heals the man so that he can now see. The leaders of the church were angry. They go to the to the man's parents. Is this not your son? Yes. How is it that he can see? We know not. We are given the opportunity to let the very scales fall from our spiritual eyes today. We are given the very opportunity to learn to repent of our sins, to not be like Saul, complacent and self-sufficient, and to let the Lord lead us. We have to make the choice. Do we want to be the army that is led by a man that is not led of God, or do we want to be led by God himself? We are in a time right now where our Heavenly Father is taking the work into his own hands. We have to choose. From whom do we wish to be led? Do we wish to be led by a man? Do we wish to be led of God? What say you today? In returning to the situation where we deal with Jonah, Jonah gave a message, and all within Nineveh repented. Was this a false message? No, it was God's message. No, it was not. Agreed, brothers. Agreed. Was the message given by Ellen White that Nineveh was to be warned of its upcoming destruction. Was this a false message? You mean Nashville? Nashville, yes. Was the message to Nashville a false message? No, it was not. So if Nineveh was not false, if Nashville was not false, then why are we looking to repent of it? We are not to criticize. We are not to throw stones figuratively or literally at other brothers and sisters. For when we are doing such, we are doing the work of the adversary. Whose work are we to do? Whose side are we on? Any other comments or questions today, brothers and sisters? Any other thoughts? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your guidance, and we thank you for your directions. Help us, Father that we may repent and become right with you. Direct us so that even if others are rejecting us, that we may be accepted by you and do that which is according to your will. Help us to follow Christ in this way. Help us to accept his mantle so that your will may be done in our lives, so that your witness may be given to all of those around us and those with whom you would have us come in contact with. Be with us now. Direct us. We ask, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.